Okay. So this last week has been a little weird, eh? I hope everyone is doing well and uh, adapting to both the administrative back and forth of online and in class and my back and forth of not being here and then being here and so on. So um, uh, just in case you missed the email that came out or the, um, the uh, announcements post on eClass, I uh, did cl I cancel class on Monday. I hope no one was, was waiting in here. And if you were, I hope you were able to get out relatively quickly. Um, sorry about that. My trip just didn't end exactly the way I was hoping for it, but that's fine. What we're going to do today is uh, kind of finish up um, with uh, what Tristan was going over last week. Um, I understand that there was some technical issues on Friday's online class. I do apologize for that. Tristan and I uh, want to try and make this the, as easy as possible, and um, it's uh, unfortunate that uh, anything went awry. Uh, speaking of that, I have uh, had some difficulty getting the recordings from that particular lecture, so uh, that's one of the reasons why things haven't been posted yet, but I'll be working most of this afternoon towards getting all of the videos up to today's class posted to YouTube and, uh, and to eClass so that you should be able to listen to the recordings, watch the videos, and so on. Um, are there any, I know that the material there is um, a few classes old, but are there any questions or comments or concerns of the materials that have been posted? Any difficulties? Uh, uh, the videos work fine or, yeah. Uh, the rest of the, oh, sorry, what do you mean the rest of the notes? Like on the class seven, um, lesson five, there's like a whole section on the screen. The stuff that's on the yeah. screen right now? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, sorry. So today I'm going to finish what was going to be finished in that lecture. Uh, so today's lecture is basically the second half of Tristan's lecture. That's why his name is right there, um, because uh, he authored a lot of these slides which um, I may stumble a bit more than usual. Uh, apologies for that. But yes, we're, we're finishing that lecture today. But uh, any difficulties or issues with the, the audio or the video that has already been posted? I will be posting more today, but things that have already been posted. No? Okay, great. So what are we doing today? Well, uh, we are going to go over... Uh, Greek theatrical performance. Where where do theaters uh, where does theatrical performance come from in the Greek world, and um, what does it have to do with uh, with Dionysus? This is somewhat peripheral to straight mythology, learning about gods and goddesses and their comings and goings, but it's very important to understand how these mythological figures interacted with people in their daily lives or perhaps more accurately, how people in their daily lives interacted with these mythological figures. And that's why we're going over it. As a specific case study or as a specific example, um, we're going to talk about Athenian theatrical performance. One, because the Athenians wrote most of the theater that we have today that has been preserved, so they're the best represented. Two, they really liked it and they spent a lot of money on it. And three, because that's what was on the slides. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then finally, we'll get to the stuff that you've actually read or seen. Uh, we'll get to the Aeschylus stuff. Um, I will go into something that you haven't seen, Prometheus Bound, uh, and then go through some story beats. This is actually a fully preserved play rather than the excerpt that you got. Uh, but it's the prequel to the excerpt that you got, Prometheus, Prometheus Freed. So that's today. Where does theater come from? So this is all somewhat hazy. I, I, will not, uh, I will not lie to you and say this is the definitive story, but please take it with um, a grain of salt. And also for the purposes of this class and this class only, this is the definitive story. Uh, that it comes from the Dithrambe. The Dithrambe is a hymn to Dionysus. So this is a, uh, a song to Dionysus 
that is sung by a chorus. It's sung by a group that get together and, uh, and sing this hymn. The leader of the chorus may, uh, this is again kind of uh, asterisks, may have uh, uh, engaged in some improvis- improvisational storytelling. So to the best of our knowledge, the Dithrambe, is, uh, the Dithrambe was a real thing, and it was a hymn to Dionysus. But the origins of theater may have come from the lead of the chorus doing improvisational storytelling and that kind of evolving into more. The chorus during the Dithrambe were dressed as satyrs. So this is kind of half man, half goat, or half man, half horse. Uh, basically getting just uh, equine or, or uh, caprid-like features. And uh, this is not the word theater, but it is the word tragedy. So the etymology of the word tragedy is uh, that it comes from Greek tragodia. And you can see the English uh, or the transliteration there. And that is uh, tragos is goat and ode, uh, ode. Um, you may know ode in, in, in English. Uh, is song, so it's um, it's goat song. So whenever whenever you say, "Oh, what a tragedy," what you can actually say is, "Oh, what a goat song." May not make you popular, especially if there was a tragedy. So uh, what's a goat song? So the uh, that etymology doesn't tell us definitively where tragedy comes from. It gives us hints of where tragedy may have come from. And so it may have been that as the chorus was doing their hymn to Dionysus and the lead was doing improvisational storytelling, afterwards they did a goat sacrifice. This fits within a cultural context, but this is just a, this is speculation, even less on the hierarchy as a theory. We are arm-waving academics. It's also possible that during early theatrical performances, a goat was given as a prize. Uh, I'm not very keen on this one because there's no prizes in later theatrical performances, but this is a possibility. Um, And then it's also uh, the possibility that the improvisational storytelling that the lead of the chorus was giving gets called the goat song because they're dressed as satyrs. And so this is a satyr, a goat man, delivering some material, a song or um, a performance. These are all wild speculation. We do not know exactly how goat song is related to tragedy uh, or playing, but it's that is uh, that's how that goes. So. The invention of um, what, ev- what evolved, what tragedy evolved into, or the actual performance, not the kind of ethereal origins in uh, in the hymn to Dionysus, but specifically uh, there is a character Thep- uh, Thespis. He had um, uh, let's yeah he he introduced uh, actors. So not just the chorus, introduced actors, and he introduced the concept of, uh, of delivering a, a larger narrative. So there's a, there's a prologue and speeches, there's segments to this performance. So in the, constru- in the reconstruction, in this ethereal past, there may have been some storytelling by the lead of the chorus, but we know for sure that Thespis has a prologue, he has speeches, and so he is credited as as the father of tragedy. These kind of terms have fallen out of favor for uh, obvious patriarchal reasons, but um, you can know that this name is associated with origins of tragedy. Um, And this also, the, uh, the introduction of Thespis marks a point where we're no longer just talking about Choral performances. It's no longer just a chorus. And we are giving way to drama, to the theater. It is, it is now a more formalized process. 
Um, there is an Athenian ruler, a, um, a dictator or tyrant, you know, Greek, got to use the proper term here, uh, Pisistratus. Don't worry too much about the dates. Just know that he is an Athenian um, tyrant. He sponsored arts, building, and, and a whole host of things. And traditionally, he is also uh, given the honor of, of having effectively formalized drama and theater in Athens. This is not something that we can say definitively as proof, but his name is associated in the development of uh, Greek theater in general and Athenian theater specifically. And he is credited with enhancing the worship of Dionysus at the Great Dionysia and the Lesser Dionysia. We'll go into that in a little bit, but these are performances, rituals, games, and so on, specific, the Dionysia, that is, specifically associated with the veneration and worship of Dionysus. And so he is credited with improving, enhancing the Dionysia, specifically at Athens, which has implications for the wider Greek world. And that's why I say not just Athens. So Pisistrasus is an Athenian. He does these uh, changes in Athens, but it radiates out into the wider Greek world. They had uh, other Greek cities had their own Dionysia. They had their own festivals for Dionysus. And changes made in Athens kind of reverberated out. Other people started changing their Dionysia as well. So, aside from goat song, what is tragedy? And this gets a bit confusing because if you read that description, a representation of serious action uh, that you have to pay attention to and treat with respect, um, and it, this mostly lines up with our modern film genre of drama. That if you go to see a drama or, or an Oscar bait movie, that's effectively an ancient Greek tragedy. But then you get confused with terms of drama uh, in, in ancient Greece and drama today. But this is, this is what you're dealing with. The ending doesn't have to be tragic in the modern English sense of the word. This is just a serious play with serious things that happen and um, you need to, uh, I don't know, wear a suit to go to see it. Uh, so it, it tended to feature the tragic kind of uh, association. It did tend to feature agony and um, the idea of bringing home events that are uncomfortable or uh, difficult to the audience. Um, this is kind of a fundamental aspect to all performance is that you can, you can somehow transmit what you are performing to your audience. And so they don't have to experience the agony firsthand. They can experience it vicariously through the play. And as an add on to that, that this is an emotional event. Um, he throws in some terminology here. <laughs> so experience catharsis. Um, that is a $10 word. So catharsis, the idea that you get release, you get release from something that is extremely painful or extremely troubling. So maybe you have yourself something that was deeply agonizing in your life, and the play will allow you to experience catharsis for that event, even though the play is showing something different. The idea here is that there is an audience that is participating emotionally with the performance, and the performance is not just for entertainment value. There is uh, a heightened state that is going on. Um, and yeah, so there's some stuff here about uh, it, it, it allows you to experience all the facets of being a human. That's a little poetic for me, but uh, it's from the poetics, so I think that tracks. So who is Dionysus, and why does he matter in the context of theater? I would say of the ancient Greek gods, Dionysus probably has the most complicated origins. In, um, 
in your textbook, there is a simplified chart at the beginning that shows who's related to who and how. And uh, Dionysus is shown as the son of... Samele. But uh, that is only one of his origin stories. Now, the difficulty here, I, we've talked a lot about the idea of multiple stories being told uh, about a particular deity and how they are representative of a genre or representative of a particular cultural place and time. The thing that becomes very complicated with Dionysus is that these multiple stories, instead of being in conflict with each other or just ignoring each other, over time get combined in. And so he gets known uh, in later periods as the god who was twice born. And so um, we will talk more about Dionysus. This is just an introduction to the god. But um, he, his story gets complicated and confusing and also very, very interesting. But at the base level, he is a male fertility deity. He very frequently has a feminizing appearance. What I mean by that is in Greek art, you generally depict men as a bit more bulky, and you generally depict women as a bit slighter. Dionysus tends to get depicted more slight. And so we say this is a feminizing appearance. There is a lot of scholarship on the transitional nature of Dionysus's gender. He is uh, strongly associated with the vine, uh, grape and ivy, and he's the god of wine and drinking. He is a fun god. But when you drink, you also perhaps lose a little control. He is associated with animal companions and the concept of losing control. So ferocious animals that can get violent at a moment's notice, ecstatic actions where you emotionally react without necessarily controlling yourself, these are all lumped in and associated with Dionysus. And on uh, the bottom there, he's the god of theater. And so all of these experiences, this interactive, what I was talking about in the theater, of that emotional interaction from the audience and the play, this is perceived as being somewhat mediated by Dionysus. Dionysus is the god of kind of losing control. And the performance at a theater is this process of emotionally getting caught up in the performance and losing yourself a little bit. Other times when you do that is uh, when you go drinking. So these things are not the same, but they have similar and connected associations. This here is just our Greek uh, map of the Greek world from the textbook. And just to kind of remind you that we are still dealing largely with the bottom part, the little hand, uh, uh, the peninsula there, and then uh, Boeotia, Aetolia, and Attica. That's predominantly where we are focused. So the city Dionysia, this is the Dionysia specific to Athens, uh, or the great Dionysia. It took place annually at the end of March. Uh, and this is when there's a lot of sailors in town. There's a lot of people there. So you have a, a wide variety of people that can attend. And as I mentioned, there were Dionysia all over the Greek world, uh, not just in cities, also rural settings. Uh, but we are focused on Athens because, as I said, they, they produced uh, a lot. It has been preserved, and that's the one that we're doing. So what does a Dionysia look like? What does this festival to Dionysus look like? Well, you had three tragedians take part. So that is, you assembled three competitors. Those competitors presented three tragedies, three plays that they had written, and then a satyr play over the course of a day. They had to apply. There was a, uh, um, 
there was a legislative, or not a legislative, a admin, administrative process for applying to present your plays at the Dionysia in Athens. And you talk to a senior city magistrate that's an archon. When you were chosen, you got a benefactor. Someone paid the bill for you to perform, for you to live and, uh, and work and make your performance. That is a korigos. You also got actors and your chorus assigned to you as part of this process. So there were actors and choral singers of Athens. When you got into the Dionysia and uh, were chosen as one of the competitors, you just got these folks assigned to you. The judges of the Dionysia, because this is a competition, were chosen from the citizen body right before the festival. So these were not permanent judges. This was not something that they, uh, if we think of now competitions, uh, people who are um, famous and, and uh, are brought in to judge, um, oh, what's the, what's the reality show where you choose the greatest singer? Yeah, America's Got Talent or something like that. Those are, you get famous judges to come in. These were regular citizens chosen just before the event. Um, hey, Yorgios, you want to do this this week or this year? That kind of thing. And the award was an ivy wreath. So you don't get a goat, but, uh, and there's also no, no evidence of money. There's no evidence of, of a prize that um, that would dramatically improve your life, of why you would be doing this? Why would you be com um, competing? This is for prestige. This is for bragging rights. You want to say, "I won, you lost. Suck it." So. Who are the constituents? Who is uh, participating in this performance? First of all, you've got the chorus. This is the original element that we trace back in that reconstruction um, from the hymn to Dionysus. Eventually, the chorus, which was originally quite important, loses in importance. And uh, the other facets that I'll... Um, go into next, gain importance. It's a grouping of 12 to 15 men. They perform an ode between scenes, and they would sing and dance. Once the center stage of the performance somewhat sidelined, um, almost uh, like a, a cheerleader group that goes on in between the play uh, performances, the different scenes. And uh, this is something that male citizens took part in the early part of their life. Uh, young, younger folk. It's not, it's not all that prestigious to be a choral singer. Um, you're the song and dance man in between the important bits. So, the chorus, what do they do in a play, in a performance? They give you background information. In, uh, in modern parlance, they give you an exposition dump. They tell you what's going on. They, they fill in the background. They fill in the context. In traditional Athenian performance, there are only three actors. So the chorus can be uh, additional characters if needed. They can kind of form a character and interaction with the, uh, the actors and the chorus. They may comment on the action. They react to events going on on, uh, on scene. And they can kind of give you a Coles Notes version of what has already happened. They can reiterate the action uh, kind of last week on this play. In some cases, the chorus is supposed to um, effectively mirror the audience. They are telling the audience what they should be thinking, or um, ostensibly they are um, reacting the same way that the playwrights believe the audience will be thinking. And uh, the, in general, they can articulate specific truths about the play. 
to um, to tell you how the plot is progressing. The actors in uh, Athenian tragedy and Greek um, theater in general, these are the folks that wear the masks. So if you're kind of a, so if you have seen a drama club sign or anything like that, they're the the masks that are part of uh, Greek theater. The actors are the ones who wear these. The masks are designed in a way that the actor can project their voice. Not quite a megaphone, but they um, they do project a little bit to kind of allow for more more travel. And actors got prizes. They could uh, get quite famous and demanding. And so this is, um, you would want to get as a playwright, you would want to get a good actor because that enhances your possibility for winning. But like modern actors, they can get airs. They can uh, get a little um, prima donna on you. And so it can be both a blessing and a curse to get a popular actor on your play. What about a physical theater? What does an Athenian theater look like? The chorus is down in that circle, the orchestra. The skene, or this is where we get the word scene from, but the skene up at the, that is the front, that is where the performance happens. In Athenian uh, theaters, of the period, of the classical period, this is a very simple stage. This is not an elaborate uh, setup. Later Roman skene are massive, are ornate art uh, um, uh, facility, uh, walls, basically a giant wall with all kinds of artwork on it. We'll show you a couple of examples in some photos here. And then the seating area is the Theatron. Uh, the Parados is, um, it's it's the it's not backstage, but it's kind of it's front stage. It's in the front, but it's backstage. If that makes any sense, it's a way of kind of moving things, uh, moving people back and forth and uh, and materials. This is a top plan of uh, of Athens, yeah, and uh, just showing you some locations of theaters. Uh, I'm not going to focus on this one too much. Uh, just notice that you can have more than one theater in a city. Just like today, um, you know, you have theaters of different sizes, of scope, of importance. And so uh, the thing, the takeaway from this slide is that in Athens, they had more than one theater. Here is a very famous theater in Athens, the Theater of Dionysus. Uh, the current version of it uh, or sorry, it was originally built in the late 4th century. And you can see the Theatron is that seating area. The orchestra is a circular area in the uh, down at the bottom. And not much of any of the skene is preserved. Now, this, this theater didn't stop existing in classical Athens. It was elaborated on and, uh, and continued to be used during the Roman period. And so it would have had a built-up large skene. But in, in uh, classical Athens, it actually wouldn't have been much more elaborate than what you see here. It's on a hillside uh, up towards the Acropolis. It's actually a really great, uh, really great site to visit if you ever get a chance to travel when COVID has uh, stopped ruining all of our lives. Here we have another example of a theater. Um, uh, we have one in Epidurus, and uh, the other in uh, the top right there is in Pergamon. We'll show you some locations on a map in a second. And then um, another theater. So this is um, in the bottom right is the theater of Atticus Herodus. This is a Roman era theater. And you can see that built up wall with portico in it, with, uh, with doorways. That is a Roman style skene. So it's it's built up. It's it's People can go in and out of it. It gets draped with cloth. They get really, really elaborate. But um, 
you would not see something that built up in the classical period. And so Epidaurus, uh, top left, and then uh, Pergamon, top right, and I'm just going to flip to the map. That's where they are in the um, Aegean world. Pergamon is actually in Asia Minor. And pay attention to that name. We will talk about Pergamon mostly towards the Roman period, but that is an important site for us. So how about we get into a playwright and some plays? This is a bust of Aeschylus. He is the earliest tragedian that we have any kind of knowledge about. He first debuts at the Dionysia in the very beginning of the 5th century. And he gets his first victory in 484. I'm not super huge on dates. Just know that he was making plays for a while before he won. He was also a soldier in uh, the Athenian military. He participated at the Battle of Marathon and the Battle of Salmis. These are two incredibly important uh, uh, events in Athenian history. And if you take uh, Greek culture, uh, um, our Greek history course, or um, any, kind of, any kind of course on Greece, these two events are massively, massively important to the development of classical Athens in specific and then the classical Greek world in general. The earliest play that he wrote that we have any material from was called The Persians. This was effectively a war movie from just after the events of the Persian War. This is something that is hard for us to do even today, making a movie about current events. Normally we wait a generation or so. And he was making plays and tragedies and performances more or less right after the events. He also traveled around and uh, got to visit Sicily a few times. It was during these travels to Sicily that it's believed he wrote Prometheus uh, Bound, Prometheus Freed, and I don't remember what the third one's called. There are a ton of plays attributed to him. We do not have these plays. But uh, our other sources say he wrote them, wrote this number. And as far as we can tell, he won the Great Dionysia 13 times. So he participated a great deal and won a great deal, but not every time. Um, quite possibly his most famous play is called The Seven Against Thebes, and that won in 467. And then he wrote a trilogy. Remember how you had to present three plays and then a satyr play? Aeschylus took this, contra uh, this construct of three plays and decided to tell one overarching story across all three of them. This was not something that others had done. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, he invented the trilogy for uh, the literary tradition that we kind of belong to. And as I mentioned, Prometheus Bound uh, was probably produced in Sicily towards the end of his life. Um, when Aeschylus was making plays, there was, it says here, there was no skene. Um, there's very simple. There, there was a very simple location for performance. Basically, what he's getting at here is that there was, there was not uh, an elaborate buildup, even, um, even, the simplified theater of Dionysus that I showed you uh, was was more complicated than the per, than the performance venues he was making his plays for. I mentioned that there were three actors in Athenian plays. When Aeschylus was writing, there were uh, there was only one, and he's like, well, let's add a second. So he uh, he got a second actor, and it was only formalized later on that a third was added. Um, his plays were written the way that we consider storytelling to work here uh, in modern day. You build up tension towards an expected climax. 
and they have a theme that believes strongly in the justice of the gods. I will say, for those of you that don't have uh, any kind of historical background, that Persian war thing that, uh, that we were, uh, just mentioned, this was essentially the largest country in the world at the time trying to conquer not just Athens, but the, the entirety of the Greek world. This was very much uh, a David and Goliath story. And the Athenians prevailed with the help of all of the other Greek city-states. It is entirely possible that this context made him believe very strongly that the justice of the gods would prevail because his city won out against impossible odds. His, um, his themes extend into... Suffering is effectively uh, some evil or bad act or foolish act that you have you have done. And then a Greek word hamartia, a mistake. You suffer because you did something stupid. You don't suffer because the world is unfair. He would fit in very nicely in 19th century London or 21st century Edmonton, unfortunately. But characters have the freedom to choose their fate. Characters basically can say, I can do the right thing and be in harmony with the gods. I can do the wrong thing and get divine punishment. This is a Laconian kylix. So this is a, a piece of pottery from the area in and around Sparta. And it depicts Prometheus bound and being attacked by uh, the bird that devours his liver. So what happens in this play, Prometheus Bound? He's bound up by Hephaestus, and then strength and violence, Kratos and Via. And he is punished for stealing fire and loving mortals. He's punished for his Generous acts to man. Strength mocks both Hephaestus and Prometheus. Hephaestus is doubting about the whole process of the, of the punishment. And Prometheus is the one getting punished. And, and strength says, both of you are fools. In the context of the play, Zeus has recently overthrown Kronos, he is a new king, replacing the old gods with the Olympian rule. And he doesn't like humans. Prometheus helped humans, Prometheus bad. But Prometheus is prophetic. He knows Zeus's fate and knows that Zeus will need him. This is something that is told to you in the play. And he knows that he will, be, he will be punished, but he will either be freed by Zeus or Zeus's successor. Within the context of the play, as well as in Greek mythology, Prometheus gave humans all kinds of stuff. My particular favorites are, gave them blind hope so that they could not foresee their death. They don't know how things are going to happen, and this is somehow a gift. He did not, I guess, like to play the lottery. Uh, fire as well. And just to give you an idea, this is you, you will not be individually tested on, on the specifics here. Fire is an, an important one. But just to know that Prometheus gave a lot to humans. He liked us. And he was, in a way, our patron. Oh, actually, uh, how to mine ores from the ground. I might come back to that because that's interesting. And it dovetails into when I talked about stone tools being the tool to overthrow the previous generation of gods. In Act 2 of this play, Oceanus takes pity on Prometheus. He says, watch what you say and change what you're doing to adapt to our uh, new rulers. 
And um, Prometheus says, Zeus is too fickle. He's going to get angry real fast. It doesn't matter what I do. So I should do the right thing and pay the crime. Can somewhat think if you've watched or listened to Hamilton, you can somewhat think of this as a discussion between Hamilton and, oh, the other guy. The one who shoots the, 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 the Burr, thank you. All I remember is uh, is smile less, talk, or talk less and smile more. That's, so that's the kind of dichotomy that we've got formed here in the play. Io is uh, haunted by go uh, ghosts and uh, wanders aimlessly about. And she wonders why Zeus is torturing her, or at least not preventing this torture. So Io is plagued by these ghosts and doesn't understand why it's happening, and she blames Zeus for it. She also doesn't know how she's going to end up, and she begs Prometheus to tell her. She said that she had previously received dreams to go to Lerna, if you remember the Lernian Hydra, this location has many supernatural uh, aspects associated with it. Go to Lerna and sleep with Zeus. Pretty good dream, I guess. Her father didn't like this, and she was expelled from the household. And when she got to Lerna, following the dream, she gets turned into a cow. Prometheus tells Io her fate and blames Zeus for the entire ordeal. If you've got gods, they can perhaps get into your head. But he says he will free her with a soft touch. That sounds kind of creepy. But I guess he says Zeus's own stupidity will be his undoing. And he will get married and give birth to a son who will overthrow him. This is another aspect of really downplaying what happens to women and the things that they suffer and characterizing the entire thing as just the way that life has to be. This is a depiction of Io as a cow. Just to let you know that these things are put on pottery and, uh, and uh, paintings and later on, much later on, mosaics. And here is uh, Io, Hermes, and Argus. In Act 4 of the play, Hermes is introduced. And he is kind of a little lackey in this story. Hermes is known for his speed. This is a god who moves around and goes quickly. And uh, he wants to know what kind of marriage will happen with Zeus. He, he's, he's, Zeus's, he's Zeus's running boy, and he wants to understand. He accuses Prometheus of being arrogant, and Prometheus fires back. Well, you're a little upstart. Someone's trying to get above their station, and they fight or at least argue. And at the end, lightning starts to crash all around Prometheus. Effectively, Zeus is here. He's, he's fed up, and um, somebody is going to suffer, and it's probably going to be Prometheus. So now we get into the, uh, the play that you actually got an excerpt from, the reading, Prometheus Freed. This play is mostly lost. We, we only have this one section. And the section that we have is a Latin translation. So this play was written in Greek. In the ancient world, in, in 2,000 years ago or, or longer, it was translated from Greek into Latin. And that Latin version was picked up by the Roman author Cicero. And he was writing a philosophical treatise, not a play. And he wanted to help him prove his own point. And so he quoted this Latin version at length. And that's why we have it, because we have the preserved writings of Cicero. That's why we have this fragment. 
the reason I bring this context up is that the names are going to be the Roman names for a lot of these gods, and it may seem a little confusing. I'm not going to read the entirety here. Just want to point out that in the beginning here, in this, in this first section, the first 10 or so lines, Prometheus is talking about his family, his kinsmen, the Titans, all of them begotten by heaven, all of them gods. And it's a warning. Look upon me, bound and fettered on jagged rocks. And Saturnian Jupiter, this is Jupiter, son of Saturn, or Zeus, son of Kronos in Greek. He has bound me. I reside here, a wretched tenant of the Furies' outpost. He's bound to a mountainside. The Furies are wind, or at least associated with wind. And so he's basically saying that he's strapped to a mountainside, being whipped by the wind. And then he describes his suffering. Every third day, a grievous day, Jupiter's attendant makes its grim swoop and tears at me. This is a bird. Rending me with hooked talons in a frenzied feeding. When a rich liver is, uh, it is gutted, stuffed, and sated. Rips out his liver, eats it, and is out of there. This suffering of Prometheus sustains the bird. And he talks about this in his in his statement of suffering. You can imagine in a play, this is somewhat similar to a kind of Shakespearean soliloquy. The Prometheus would come out and talk about all of these pains that he is suffering. So all I'm going to read from here, uh, but uh, the, I mean, this was, a, this was your reading uh, from last week and the slides will be up on, uh, on E-Class. So, what do we have in terms of cultural values on display in Prometheus Freed? Suffering under leaders. This is something that you are going to have to endure. The genre of the original play is that performance, that tragedy. The Latin transposition is a philosophical treatise. It's a, a kind of a more distanced, you read this at your leisure on your own, not as part of, uh, part of a, a performance. Authenticity in terms of themes, not generally relevant here. We're not talking about one version being original or not. In the conclusion of the, the of the trilogy, the Prometheus Bound trilogy, Zeus improves and expresses better leadership. And this kind of emphasizes the idea that under a brutal leader, you suffer now, but they will improve and you are obligated to help them improve. So it normalizes suffering under a leader. Just kind of go over what we did today. We talked about Greek theater and its origins. We talked about Dionysus and his connection to that theater. For Athens, we talked about the Dionysia and their physical theaters. And then for Aeschylus, we talked about the Prometheus Bound trilogy and Zeus's character development. Thank you. Have a good day.